Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming out today and braving the weather and the traffic. Uh, I know it's been horrific on both counts for some of you. Um, sorry, I really am quite short. <laughs> I won't fiddle with it, though, because it will all go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my name's Sarah Passmore, and I'm the Head of Education and Promotions at the British Humanist Association. Um, I've been with the organisation for about five months now, uh, so not very long, but what I have been doing over the past five months is going to a lot of events that we've put on, and what I've found is that we've constantly had really incredible speakers coming and delivering talks for us. We've got some really wonderful supporters and a really great group of people who come out to these events, so I'd like to thank you all for coming, and thank you very much to uh, Ray Tellis and John Harris for coming out today. Um, I won't do the introductions of our speakers because I'm sure that they're probably much more qualified to talk about themselves than I am. But I am very, very grateful for you to come out today and uh, deliver this talk for us at the Hollyoak Lecture of 2011. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over. Thank you very much. I'm John Harris, and I, I gave the Hollyoak Lecture last year. Uh, and Ray introduced me. So what you're going to get this year is, I'm, he's, I'm going to give the introduction that he gave me last year. He's going to give the lecture that I gave him, and then we'll all know where we are. But it is a real pleasure to be able to introduce Ray, firstly because he's a very long-standing friend of mine, and I'm very proud uh, to call him a friend, but also proud of the fact that I've learned so much from him. He is undoubtedly, I would say, the foremost public intellectual we have in the United uh, he is a real Renaissance man. He has so many skills, it is embarrassing. He is a considerable philosopher. His philosophy is my God. This makes me mad and jealous. But in addition to being a considerable philosopher, he's a very distinguished medical scientist and general pathologist. He is a neurologist. He is a poet. Uh, he is a formidable critic, and he has, I think, the most wonderfully acerbic wit of anybody writing in England today. I also have had the pleasure of reading, reading his latest book, Aping Mankind, which he's going to uh, talk to, if not at, today. So it is the greatest of possible pleasures to introduce to you Ray Tallis, and I know we are going to have a scintillating evening. Right. Blimey. Thank you, John. I mean, after that introduction, the sensible thing would be for me to drop dead, leaving you with tremendous expectation of something that I can't possibly live up to, but thank you for that marvelous introduction. And indeed, it's, you're quite right, the second Holyoke lecture, um, I, 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 I uh, introduced John, and I very much enjoyed your talk on enhancing humanity. One of the awful things about us, we've got nothing to say to each other, because we agree on so many things, we have to send out for a straw man largely, don't we? Think. Can I just check, is my machine working? I mean, you know, the thing. Yeah, I just want to be absolutely sure because uh, I gave a lecture a little while back. On the end of it, someone told me, you know, your microphone wasn't working throughout. Well, I could see your lips, but I couldn't hear what was coming out, so I want to be absolutely sure. Anyway, it's not very clear. I thought it was. Hang on a moment. Rather, I think they, they'd like to hear what I have to say. They may not like it when they hear it, but they'd like to hear it, to judge it, you know. Can you hear me, Mother? All right at the back? Is that okay? Fine. Anyway, it is a very great honor to give the third Holyoke Lecture. And it is a very great pleasure to talk to fellow humanists. I had that pleasure three or four weeks ago when we talked about the challenges to humanism in the 21st century. Anyway, there are many familiar and friendly faces in the audience. And the pleasure is indeed greatly enhanced by being chaired by John. The circuit is now complete, as it were. We have to, who, who are they going to chair and who's going to be chaired next year? God only knows. And instantly, John's going to kindly be my assistant. He hasn't got cheerleader's legs and short skirt, but it's all we can get for the night. And he's going to press the knob when required uh, so that the slides move forward. Are you okay on that? Yeah, well, let's see how it goes, shall we? Anyway, I, it's particularly welcome because it gives me an opportunity to talk about something that's been ex exercising me over the last 30 odd years. Although it's only recently that I'd be able to put together my thoughts on this matter in a single place. A book, John referred to, 
available in all places where truth and enlightenment is valued. Anyway, it's called, next slide please, this is the test. Probably good in the actually, yes. It's called Aping Mankind, Neuromania, Darwinitis and the Misrepresentation of Humanity. And its topic is something that I feel is central to our preoccupation as hum humanists. I think there's an important job to be done in the coming decades in developing a clear idea of what we humans are, what image we can form of ourselves in the, well, in the wake of the welcome decline of religious belief. And this job will be all the harder if we commit ourselves to the wrong ideas that I'm going to focus on in this address. Now, if you feel at times that this lecture is given by someone who has a chronic obsession, you will not be mistaken. My dispute with neuromania goes back to the time when I was a medical student at Oxford, focusing on neurophysiology and arguing my, with my infinitely patient tutor about what neuroscience can and cannot explain. My master theme is biologism, the assumption that we humans are essentially animal organisms and are best understood through the biological sciences. This is an idea of some antiquity, but it currently has unprecedented currency in academe, in the Republic of Letters, and in the popular press. And one of the most disturbing consequences of the ascendance of biologism is the belief, increasingly widespread in academe, that the humanities should acknowledge the cognitive superiority of biological science and capitulate to the imperialist ambitions of neuroscience and evolutionary theory. Next slide. Now traditionally, we thought of human beings as persons who are conscious agents, responsible to a greater or lesser degree for their actions and offset, to some extent, from the natural world. And this is a view that I believe lies at the heart of humanism. The alternative view of humans as organisms that are part of the natural world, alas, is now gaining strength. We are told we are not as distant from nature as construed by the natural sciences as we imagine we were. We do not so much lead our lives as enact our biological inheritance. Any impression we have to the contrary is based on an illusion. Thank you. Now, there are many reasons behind the bi rise of bio biologism, but the most important are firstly, the astonishing advances in our understanding of the human body, the human organism. This has been incorrectly interpreted as telling us what it is to be a human being. The second is the assumption, common in secular societies, that if we abandon supernatural accounts of what we are, we're also obliged to deny our distance from the natural world and to seek a naturalistic, a biological or even physical understanding of what we are. Thank you. Now, both of these assumptions are wrong. We are more than just our bodies as understood biologically. We are embodied, embodied subjects who are, who possess, who utilize, take care of, judge, interpret, and have factual knowledge of our bodies in a multitude of ways. And I feel there's a middle position that sees us as neither supernatural nor entirely part of nature. We are extra natural. Thank you. Now, biologism is founded on two pillars of unwisdom, neuromania and Darwinitis. And I want to offer you a brief definition of each. Thank you. Neuromania is based on the assumption that human consciousness is identical with neural activity in the human brain. I am my brain. You are your brain. Thank you. The brain explains every aspect of human awareness and behavior. And from this, it follows that if you really want to understand human beings, you must peer into the darkness inside the skull using neuroscientific techniques for recording brain activities. Thank you. Now, the neuromaniac's favorite tool, toy is a tool which has made huge contributions to pucker neuroscience. That is functional magnetic resonance imaging. An example which... Thank you. you want to go back a bit? There we go. Just in the training phase, but it's okay. It's coming on quite nicely, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you're doing jolly well. A functional MRI imaging... An example of which you see here, though it has become a fast-acting solvent of the critical sense, as Matt Crawford has said. Thank you. It's almost impossible to open a newspaper without an example of a brain scan next to an article breathless with excitement, reporting that scientists have found the secret of love, of wisdom, or of our sense of beauty. You just expose subjects to the relevant stimuli and see which bits of the brain light up. Now let's turn our attention to the other pillar, Darwinitis. This is an inflamed or pathological version of Darwinism, which asserts that evolutionary theory explains not only how the organism Homo sapiens arose, which of course it does, but also the nature of people like you and me. Thank you. Evolutionary forces, natural selection, survival advantage, 
explain the origin and purpose of human behavior and human institutions. Everything is forged in and distantly or otherwise relates to the bloodbath in which genes are shaped by the differential survival of organisms. The processes that produce millipedes are just the processes that produce Mozart. Thank you. In brief, it is the assumption that Darwinism encompasses not only the biological roots of the human organism, but the cultural leaves of the human person. And the boldest, most far-reaching, and the most hilariously crude manifestation of Darwinitis is evolutionary psychology, to which I may return. Next slide, please. So much for the two pillars of biologism. They're, of course, closely connected. If the human mind is identical with the functioning of the brain, and the brain, as it surely is, is an evolved organ, then our minds, our consciousness, and our conscious behavior must be understood in evolutionary terms, as ultimately the servant of the reproductive imperative of the selfish gene. Since, as Dobzhansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, the neural explanation of human consciousness demands a Darwinian interpretation of our behavior. The mind is simply the most powerful of the organs in the vehicle that the genes requisition to ensure its own survival. Now you might think this all sounds pretty harmless stuff. Or better than harmless, a frank acknowledgement of what we are. But I want to look at the consequences of biologism as they are drawn by those few writers who acknowledge them. Consider first the consequences of neuromania as drawn out by the eminent neuroscientist Colin Blakemore in his excellent wreath lecture, The Mechanics of Mind, many years ago. This is Colin. Did you? I think you had, don't worry. I was, I was able to fancy footworks, the name of the game. So there you go. The human brain is a machine which alone accounts for all our actions, our most private thoughts, our beliefs. All our actions are products of the activity of our brain. It makes no sense in scientific terms to try to distinguish sharply between acts that result from conscious attention and those that result from our reflexes or are caused by disease or damage to the brain. This has huge implications, of course, for our freedom. If we are identical with our brains, or with certain neural discharges in them, then we must be just as unfree when we're writing a textbook about the management of seizures, as I have, as when we are ourselves in the grip of a seizure. It makes no sense in neuroscientific terms to distinguish between these things. And many have drawn this conclusion and asserted that free will is an illusion. Rita Carter, a brilliant popularizer of neuroscience, has even offered an explanation of the illusion in Darwinian terms. She says, the illusion of free will is deeply ingrained. This, oops, way we we'll go back to that. It's dying to get to the pub, basically, that's what the hurry is. It's deeply ingrained precisely because it prevents us from falling into a suicidally fatalistic state of mind. It is one of the brain's most powerful aids to survival. It is an illusion, she feels, that should have no future. If we are in the grip of biological forces, which boil down to physical forces, we cannot be aware of the true reasons for our actions. Indeed, we're not really agents at all. Thank you. We are absorbed into nature, natural parts of a natural world, which, given that living matter is ultimately regulated by the laws of matter, Foucault, we are material parts of the material world, wired into the forces of physical nature. Next slide, please. Now, some of this... Next slide, thank you. Some of this is acknowledged with great good cheer by many writers, notably Daniel Dunnett, when he speaks of Darwin's dangerous idea as a universal acid that eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview, in which our most cherished beliefs about God, yippee, value, meaning, purpose, culture, and morality are shown to be without foundation. Of course, this only applies if we think that accepting Darwinism requires us to subscribe to Darwinitis. Dunnett, being an atheist like me, is quite sanguine about this and imagines that it is consistent with humanism. I would strongly contest this, as, it, uh, as does Alex Rosenberg in his nihilistic Darwinism. He argues that Dunnett correctly saw the corrosive effects of Darwin's theory, but then failed to acknowledge that this would lead to metaphysical nihilism, that the world, nature, and human life are empty of meaning. An ethical nihilism. Morality is not about values, but about the needs of our genes. Ultimately, everything we do is an expression of the blind laws of physics. This is only true if we believe that Darwinism implies Darwinitis. Thank you. I insist that makes it rather extraordinary that so many in the humanities, which one would expect would be a bulwark against scientism, 
should have embraced neuroscience and evolutionary theory as the guide to their own disciplines with such enthusiasm. Collaboration rather than resistance seems to have been the watchword. Thank you. They've listened to the words of the once despised prophet, E.O. Wilson, who argued that the humanities, ranging from philosophy and history to moral reasoning, comparative religion, and interpretation of the arts, will draw closer to the sciences and partly fuse with them. And just in case you have forgotten where this might lead to, Wilson spells it out in his visionary, appalling visionary consilience, his dream of unified knowledge. Total consilience, he says, holds that nature is organized by simple universal laws of physics to which all other laws and principles can eventually be reduced. The humanities, that is in other words, are simply primitive physics. And when they see themselves aright, they will acknowledge this. Of course, they haven't quite got this far, but there are some impressive halfway hazards. For example, there is a flourishing pseudo-discipline of neuroesthetics, which explains both creativity and aesthetic pleasure in terms of activity in certain parts of the brain. Brain tingles is all. This propensity for brain tingles has been implanted in us by evolution, hence Darwinian aesthetics, which makes sure that we tingle to the right kinds of things. For example, pictures of landscapes loaded with food. Neurolaw aims to replace the untidy processes of the current judicial system with a biological justice rooted in an understanding of the neural cause of action. Slide. Neuroeconomics can explain why we buy things we don't need or we shouldn't buy by looking at the balance between the wanted center in the amygdaloid body and the wait until you can afford it center in the frontal lobes. <laughs> Those toxic subprime mortgages were in fact neurotoxic. <laughs> Conspicuous consumption and our trillion pound debts are due to our desire to advertise our genetic health. Europoliticians tell us we should look beyond the ideologies of the right and left to an understanding of the rivalry between the left and the right hemisphere. Neurotheologians look for God spots in the brain where religious experiences and beliefs are located. The evolutionary theorists of religion tell us that the God spot has been implanted in our brain because religion, believe it or not, promotes solidarity. But is present in, for example, evolutionary approaches to art, as in the idea that even great art is explained by the desire of the artist to attract mates and spread his genes. Tell that to Beethoven. Art itself, music and literature in particular, is an adapted device to bind the community together and hence improve their collective capacity to ensure the replication of their genetic material. The dog eat dog, dog, dog eat dog, greed is good, feature of capitalism is a manifestation of the survival of the fittest. And conspicuous consumption is a means by which, like the peacock's tail, we advertise the health of our genes and attract mates. Ethics is also rooted in the replicative imperative of the selfish gene. Even altruism or religious belief can be explained in evolutionary terms by employing the notion of inclusive fitness. This is the sum of an organism's classical fitness, how many of its own offspring it produces and supports, and the number of equivalents of its own offspring it can add to the population by supporting or cooperating with others. It's fine to lay down your life for another as long as this results in more copies of your genes being carried by another, in another organism, and so on, and so forth. Next slide. Now, it would take, not take very long to expose the fallacies that are the foundation stones of all these pseudodisciplines. I don't think I have time in the present talk, but perhaps we can discuss, discuss it in discussion time. Never mind, it's all in the book. The point for the present is that they are symptoms of a biologistic view of mankind, and this is my target. The fact that such a view has undesirable consequences, of course, should not itself cut any eyes. Like Just because you don't like something, it doesn't make it untrue. There's only an accidental connection between that which is palatable and that which is true. I find it incredibly impalatable to think that I'm going to die one day, but this doesn't mean to say that follows that I'm immortal. Yuck is not an argument. So let me now focus on the fundamental errors of neuromania and Darwinitis. Next slide. I'm going to start with neuromania. Thank you. I'd like to look briefly at the logical errors behind neuromania, then talk about current limitations of the science that make many claims premature, and finally about the fundamental barriers to neural explanation of consciousness that will remain even if the current limitations of science were overcome. Next slide. First, a central muddle. Now, as a clinical neuroscientist for many years, I am fully aware that to live a human life 
requires a brain in some kind of working order. What I dispute is that it follows from this that living a human life is to be a brain in some kind of working order. Thank you. Neuroscience reveals some of the most important necessary conditions of behavior and awareness. What it does not do is to provide a satisfactory account of the sufficient conditions of awareness and behavior. The mistaken idea that it does is neuromania. Next slide. The profound philosophical error is to assume that correlation between neural activity and certain levels of wakefulness, kinds of experience, propensity to behave in a certain way, means that this neural activity is wakefulness, is identical with experience, is the whole story of the propensity to behave in a certain way. So much for the logical error. Let me now move to the empirical problems and illustrate them with two much discussed studies which seem to some to confirm that even our most complex feelings and emotions and activities are reducible to brain activity, and that even when we feel that we are acting voluntarily, our brains are in fact calling the shots. I'm going to refer first of all to Semiozeki and Andreas Bartel's study of the neurobiology of love, and secondly, Benjamin Libet's studies of voluntary motor activity. First, Semiozeki and Andrea Barzell's claim that they have discovered the center for romantic love, as they reported in a respectful journal in 2001. Slide. Your next slide. What do they do? They asked their subjects to look at a photograph of the face of someone with whom they were deeply in love, and then at those of three friends. By subtracting the activity of the brain recorded when the subject looked to their friend, from that which was seen when they looked to their lovers, they claim to be able to demonstrate the distinctive brain activity associated with love, brackets, romantic. They've also done work on love, brackets, maternal, and love, brackets, uh, unconditional. Well, here it is. Next slide, please. Love, romantic, is in the medial insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, and subcortically in the caudate nucleus, and pitomen, and you'd be glad to know, all bilaterally. <laughs> but you want it in pictures, and here's the picture of love. <laughs> Now, such studies wake and wonder not that love could be tucked away in such a small space, but how could anyone fail to see the fallacies in the experimental design? These are many and various, but the most striking, of course, is the grotesque reduction of the state of being in love. Next slide. Love is not a response to a simple stimulus such as a picture. It's not even a sim single enduring state, like being cold. It is a many splendid and many misery thing. Next slide. As anyone who's been in love, or read about it in a book, or even in a craning book, will know that it includes many things. Here are a few. Not feeling in love at that moment. Hunger for. Delight over the beloved. Wanting to be kind to. Wanting to impress the special other. Worrying over meeting. Lust, awe, surprise, joy, guilt, anger, jealousy. Imagining conversations, events, etc., etc. Next slide. To construe this as the property of a small part, of a small giblet, or even as an, of an organism, is to overlook the extent, notwithstanding all its physiological components and the biological roots of some aspects of it, the extent to which it belongs to a self, relating to a community of minds, of which more present. Next slide. Please. The neuralization of love requires its prior reduction to the response to something like a simple, repeatable stimulus. And this is deeply connected with the project of stuffing something whose theater is the community of selves operating in the human world, back into the intracranial darkness of the stagnant brain. Even the neuroscience community is starting to get a bit twitched about simplistic identification of activity in parts of the brain with human feelings and propensities to behavior. In a paper originally provocatively entitled Voodoo Correlations in Neuroscience, Ed Bowles and Harold Pashler found flaws with the localization observed in such studies. Slide, but the process of simplification, to prepare, prepare a piece of our humanity to be stuffed back into the brain, is evident in my second example, a famous set of experiments carried out by the neurophysiologist Benjamin Libet in the 1980s, and repeated and refined many times since, and described by the very serious neurophysiologist Patrick Haggard as one of the philosophically most challenging studies in modern scientific psych psychology. This study seems to show that our brain makes decisions to act before our conscious mind is aware of them. So they're not really our decisions at all. Next slide. In a typical experiment, libid subjects are instructed to make a simple movement to bend their right wrist or the fingers of their right hand in their own time. 
using electroencephalography or brainwave recording, the experimenter records a particular activity in the brain that is associated with the readiness to move. This is the so-called readiness potential. And it's seen in part of the cerebral cortex most closely associated with voluntary movement. Libet also asked his subjects to recall the position of a spot revolving around a clock face in order to determine the time when they were first aware of their urge or intention to make a movement. To his surprise, he found that the readiness potential occurred a consistent third of a second before the time at which the subjects reported being aware of a decision to move. Libet concluded from this that the brain, not the subject, not the person, decided to initiate, or at least to prepare to initiate, the act before there was any reportable subjective awareness of a decision having been made. But more simply, the cerebral accompaniments of our actions seem to occur before our conscious awareness of deciding to perform them. Next slide. John Dylan Hayes and his colleagues carried out studies in which a succession of letters were displayed on a screen. Subjects were asked to press a left or a right button at the moment of their own choosing and to note the letter which was being displayed at the time they felt that they were making a decision to press a button. The letter was a time marker. Two regions that lit up in the brain predicted the subject's choice of left or right button. So it's again, it's really interesting. Two regions that lit up the brain predicted the subject's choice of left or right button. Remarkably, the regions in question in the part of the cerebral cortex associated with voluntary movement lit up a full five seconds before the individual was aware of having made a choice. Moreover, there were other areas in the frontal cortex, traditionally ascribed executive powers, that were active no less than seven seconds before awareness of the decision. If the delay in the response of the scanner detecting the activity was accounted for, the interval increased to 10 seconds. Such a delay could not be due to the subject mistiming the intention to move. The authors concluded that there is a network of high-level control areas that begins to prepare a decision long before it enters awareness. Next slide, please. It looks like we don't know what we're doing until we've found we've done it. Next slide, please. And from these and many other experiments, Daniel Wegner has concluded that the only connection between willing and acting is they both come from the same unconscious source. Next slide, please. Hold on a moment, not so fast. The action the subjects were asked to perform was the simplest imaginable, a flexing of the wrist, a mere movement. That movement, however, was itself only a minute part of a long sequence of movements amounting to a large-scale action which could be described as taking part in Dr. Libby's experiment. This large-scale action began at least as far back as getting up in the morning to visit Dr. Libet's laboratory, after perhaps setting the alarm to make sure it wasn't or wasn't late. It involved consenting to take part in an experiment whose nature and purpose and safety was fully understood, and required, among many other things, listening to and understanding and agreeing to the instructions that were received, and then deciding to flex the race. In other words, the immediate prior intention the psychological event timed by Libet was not the whole story of the action, only a tiny part of it. It was preceded by many others that were minutes, hours, perhaps days before the action. The real story is not just the flexing of the wrist, but one of a sustained and complex resolve being maintained over a very long time. And this includes many large items of behavior, getting on and off buses, looking for a parking space, looking for the laboratory, getting cross cancelling or declining other commitments so as to be free to attend the lab, and so on and so forth. And these, of course, have many hundreds of thousands of major components. Once this is appreciated, then the temporal relation between the last step, the wrist flexing, and the readiness potential seen in the lab becomes entirely unimportant. The decision to participate in the experiment, which alone gave the wrist flexion its meaning, began not milliseconds, not seconds, not minutes, but hours, perhaps days, before the wrist was flexed. The flexing of the wrist is just the last component of an action called taking part in Dr. Libet's experiment, which would itself be part of a greater intentional whole, such as wanting to please Dr. Libet, or indeed wanting to help those clever scientists understand the brain, as it want, might one day help doctors to treat my child's brain injury more effectively. Next slide. But Libet's experiment illustrates brilliantly how the neuromaniac case against freedom is rooted in, the very, in a very distorted conception of what constitutes an action in everyday life. 
If you want to make voluntary actions seem involuntary, the first thing you have to do is strip away their context, take away the self from which they originate, torch off the nexus of meanings that is the world to which they're addressed, and then effectively break them down into their physical elements. This gets you well on the way to eliminating the difference between a twitch and a deliberate action, and to make an action seem as if, as if it could be explained by a burst of nerve, nerve impulses embedded in an impersonal or no person neural reality rather than in a first-person world where behavior is not atomic but interconnected. The locus of free will is not, is, is a, is, the locus of free will is a field of intention rooted in the self and its world that extends beyond the laboratory. No wonder in the laboratory setting, actions look simply like events that happen to the actor. They are then seen to be mere effects. So much for the empirical evidence that seems to support the assumption that consciousness boils down to neural activity. In fact, of course, it is based on the assumption that consciousness is neural activity. And let me subject this assumption directly to criticism. Thank you. My critique is based upon this inescapable fact. When we're talking about the brain, we're talking about a piece of matter subject to the laws of physics. Thank you. This is what Daniel Dunnett a leading proponent of neuromania, pointed out. Here it goes. There's only one sort of stuff, namely matter. The physical stuff of physics, chemistry, and physiology. And the mind is somehow nothing but a physical phenomenon. In short, the mind is the brain. We can, in principle, account for every mental phenomenon using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain radioactivity, continental drift, photosynthesis, reproduction, nutrition, and growth. Take a deep breath. Now, if we keep this in mind, we have enough ammunition to demonstrate the necessary failure of neuroscientific accounts of human consciousness and conscious behavior. And I emphasize human consciousness because it has unique features that are particularly intractable to assimilation into matter. Intentionality, first-person being, unity within and over time, and temporal death. And I'll come back to those. My central message, which is on the next slide, my system, is this, if we have serious problems and even ground floor, con uh, uh, if we have serious problems understanding the relationship between brain and even ground floor consciousness, it's daft to look to brain science to cast light on the upper stories of human consciousness, on our sense of beauty, on love and wisdom. Hence, I'm going to focus on the basic level and I'm going to take you through some philosophical arguments which at times may seem a bit hard going. And I want to blame your suffering in the next five to ten minutes on the neuromaniacs. If they didn't choose their stupid ideas, you wouldn't have to sit through what follows the next 10 minutes. <laughs> next slide. So let's begin on the ground floor with perception as it is experienced in humans. The explicit sense of being aware of something other than oneself. Consider my awareness of John in front of me. Or perhaps this person, the glass, look at the glass in front of her. Next slide. Now the standard account says that her perception of the glass is the result of the light reflected from the glass entering her eyes and triggering activity in the visual pathway. There is an unbroken causal chain connected the glass with neural activity in my brain. This chain of cause and effects is entirely compatible, of course, with physical science. Unfortunately for neuromania, the inward causal path, that's the upper up, up arrow, does not deliver her awareness of the glass as an item explicitly separate from her, as over there with respect to herself over here. That's the lower arrow. There's nothing in the activity in the visual cortex, in nerve impulses that are material objects, in material events in a material object, which will make that activity be about the thing that she sees, about something that is explicitly other than herself. Next slide, please. The inward causal chain explains, in short, how the light gets into her brain, but not how this results in a gaze that looks out. In other words, we have something fundamental that is left unexplained. And this is what philosophers call intentionality. And in what makes the activity in the visual cortex, my visual cortex, for example, be about the glass. Next slide. Intentionality is utterly mysterious, not the least because it points in the opposite direction to causality. In the opposite direction of the causal chain that passes into the visual cortex, through it to other parts of the cortex, and eventually to those parts of the brain that are associated with motor activity, with behavior. Intentionality is not feedback or reverse causation. Rather, it is something that opens up an otherwise causally closed world and makes it something that an agent can operate on. Now, 
If neuromania were true, my perception of the glass would require the neural activity in the visual cortex to reach causally upstream to the events that cause that neural activity. But this is inexplicable in material terms. And crucially for my argument, it is most explicitly developed in human perception. It's where we have to begin when we're trying to understand human consciousness. The neural theory of consciousness cannot deal with the essentially relational aspect of consciousness, for which a single player, neural activity, is not enough. Intentionality, which cannot be ascribed to material events such as nerve impulses, is of the utmost significance. It tears open the hitherto seamless fabric of a causally closed material world. It is, as I describe in pitiless length in my book, the seed of first person being, of a viewpoint. A viewpoint that is planted in a no person, viewpointless physical universe. It is the basis of our uniquely human freedom, the basis of the community of minds and of the human world, that nexus of meaning and signs, the semiosphere that is beyond the biosphere and beyond the reach of neuroscience. Slide. Suffice it to say that it creates the possibility of an ever widening gap between the conscious individual and the material world. This possibility is realized in humans who are not simply organisms but embodied subjects. Thank you. Their awareness is of the form that such and such is the case. You and I are surrounded not just by matter, but by thatter, that X is the case, most ex clearly expressed in factual knowledge, held in common and housed in language, such as the body of knowledge that is brain science itself. Thank you. Focusing on intentionality brings us to the heart of the trouble that the neural theory of perception and consequently of higher consciousness is in. Its central claim that the material interaction between two material objects, say the brain and the glass, will cause one to appear to the other. The counter-causal direction of intentionality not only shows that this cannot be accommodated in physical science, which is the ultimate parent of neuroscience, but that appearance is not something that the material world, as seen through science, affords. Next slide. Please. And indeed we could go further and argue that the progressive enclosure of the world within the framework of physical science its being construed as a material world tends towards the elimination or the disappearance of appearance. I want to say a bit more about this. Thank you. As the science of matter progresses, measurement takes us further from actual experience, takes us away from the phenomena of subjective consciousness to a realm in which things are described in abstract, general, quantitative terms. The most obvious symptom of this is the way that physical science has to discard secondary qualities. Items such as color experiences, feelings of warmth, cold, and taste. As Galileo, echoed by the philosopher John Locke, pointed out, these secondary qualities are regarded as somehow unreal, sort of ontologically shabby, or at least as falling short of what the furniture of the material world, indeed the world, is in itself. For the physicist, light is not itself bright or colorful. It is a mixture of vibrations in an electromagnetic field of different frequencies. The material world, far from being colourful, noisy and smelly, is composed of colourless, silent, odourless atoms or quarks or whatever you like, whose nature and behaviour is best described mathematically. Physical science, I have to say, is about the marginalisation and ultimately the disappearance of phenomenal appearance. Consciousness, however, is centrally about such appearances. Next slide, please. So nothing in physical science can explain why a physical objects such as a brain should find, uncover or create appearances, and in particular, secondary qualities in the world. Thank you. We could put this another way. Matter in itself does not generate viewpoints. Thank you. There are no appearances without viewpoints. For example, there are no phenomenal appearances of a rock that are neither from the front, nor from the back, nor from any other angle. The view from nowhere, to use Thomas Nagel's phrase, of physical science does not accommodate viewpoints. You can see. Next slide, please. So this is how the material world looks as revealed by another bit of the material world. Next slide. The Schrodinger wave equation captures an ultimate, all-encompassing scientific truth about the world, a viewless view of material reality that has nothing to say about the experience of the world. Although, of course, it is indirectly based on experience of the world mediated through the techniques and instruments of science. Next slide. The loss of appearances and a first-person viewpoint is not an accident. It is an inevitable consequence of the scientific conception of matter. The brain, being a piece of matter, must be person-free. No wonder neuroscience cannot find the self or the conscious agent in the brain. And this is true not in the fundamental sense that I've just highlighted, 
but at a less fundamental but no less important sense. Next slide. Persons or selves have two features which cannot be captured in neural terms. Unity and multiplicity and temporal depth. And I want to touch briefly on these. Firstly, unity and multiplicity. At any given moment, I'm aware of a multitude of experiences, of sensations, perceptions, memories, and thoughts and emotions. I am not just conscious of them, I am co-conscious of them. That is to say, they're integrated into a unity of sorts. It's very difficult to see how this integration is possible, since neurophysiology assigns them to spatially different parts of the brain. Aspects of consciousness, we are to believe, are kept very tidily apart. The pathways for perception are separate from those for emotion, which are separate from those for memory, which are separate from those for motivation, which are separate from those for judgment, and so on. Within perception, vision, hearing and smell have different pathways, and within, say, visual perception, different parts of the brain are supposed to be responsible for receiving the color, the shape, the distance, the classification, the purpose, and the emotional significance of seen objects. When, however, I see the glass on the table over there, and see that it's broken, and feel cross about it, while I hear you laughing and recognizing the laughter as yours, and I'm upset, and I know the taxi I've ordered has arrived so I can catch the train that I'm aware I must not miss, many things that are kept apart must somehow be brought together. There's no model of such synthesis in the brain. This is a so-called binding problem, and various solutions have been offered, most of them ludicrous, but none of them work, and I'll be happy to discuss that in question time. Next slide. But what of the neurological explanation of the other distinctive feature of subjectivity? Temporal depth, depth in time. The human subject is aware of a past, her own past and the shared past, and reaches into a future, her own and a shared future. But I just want to focus on the past. Next slide, please. Now, there are many neurophilosophical, neurophysiological putative accounts of memory, but they have one thing in common. They see memory, in Henri Bergson's slightly scornful phrase, as a cerebral deposit. Memory is, to use the slippery term, stored as an effect on the brain, expressed in its altered reactivity. This has been demonstrated to the satisfaction of many neurophysiologists and cognitive neuroscientists in creatures as disparate as apes, chick embryos, and proof flies. Some of the most lauded work on memory in the bird commas, which won Eric Kandel his, two, his 2000 Nobel Prize, has been on, wait for it, the sea slug, slide. The failure of neurophysiological accounts of memory is a theme for talk in itself, but let me cut to the chase. Next slide, please, sorry. The chase needs to be cut to more quickly. A putative neural account of memory cannot deal with the difference between perceptions of memories because there is no past tense or indeed future tense in the material world. Consciousness, with his implicit sense of now, is required to locate events in one panel or other of the triptych, past, present future. The conscious subject, subject is required to provide a reference point. This is why Einstein said that physicists know that the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Tensors are not present in the material world. It doesn't of course mean that tensors are an illusion. It means that basically physical science cannot capture them. Next slide. Now there are many more philosophical problems in Euromania, but you're probably saying enough already. I hope I've convinced you of the groundlessness of neuromania and of its central idea that neural activity is identical with consciousness so that brain science is the key to understanding humanity. Now, once we've established that mind and brain activity are not identical, then we've also pulled the rug from beneath Darwinitis, since the mind ceases to be something that has co-evolved with the brain. Darwinitis, however, deserves some attention of its own, because it is such a dominant presence in our thinking. The notion that we are just animals and the difference between human life in the library or the operating theatre and animal life in the jungle or the savannah are more apparent than real. It needs to be challenged. And to combat this view by appealing to high-end activities such as composing symphonies, religious worship, or fretting over transfinite numbers is a mistake. The differences between ourselves and beasts are wall to wall, and they relate as much to those things that seem to be mirrored in animal behaviour as to those which we which which are ex explicitly unique to humans. The thing is that we humans take the biological givens and transform them out of all recognition. Next slide, please. And I want to illustrate this with a couple of homely examples. Feeding behavior, learning behavior, and I might leave communication out. First feeding. Supposing you invite me out for a meal. 
Having learned you've just taken on a big loan for a house, which has just been transformed into a mound of negative equity, I choose the cheapest items on the menu. And I falsely declare, whew, that I'm full left to the main course, so as to spare the expense of a pudding. A chimpanzee gives a banana to another chimpanzee who eats it. Darwinitics would like to say that both the chimp and I are doing similar things because we're both ex exhibiting feeding behavior. This identity of description, however, obscures huge differences between the chimp's behavior and mine. Anyone who's acquainted with the most routine dinner table, the product of a vast number of deliberate actions on the part of those sitting around it, must be on their guard when they hear the phrase feeding behavior applied to both humans and beasts. An ordinary meal is the end point of a long journey away from biology. Cooking, eating regulated by the clock and the calendar, the complex structure of meals and the grammar of what goes with what, the ritualistic, symbolic, and celebratory aspects of eating, the multitude of items of tableware that have come from near and far, the journeys taken by the food to the table, the journeys undertaken by those who gather around the table, and the use of money as an all-purpose commodity to purchase food. These are just a few of the ways in which human dining is remote from animal eating. These are all increasingly sophisticated aspects of man, the animal who does things explicitly, and whose natural medium is a community of minds extending geographically across the globe and historically into the accumulated consciousness of the race. The laid and laden table draws on four quarters of the earth and on great tracks of past and present human consciousness. Even something as simple as buying a can of beans is surrounded by implicit frameworks of action and understanding, shops, contracts, sustained intentions, commodities, money, that have no counterpart in animal life. Next slide. And take learning behavior. Here's a fairly ordinary example. I decide to improve my career prospects by signing up for a degree course, which begins next year. But I have a small child. I therefore do more babysitting this year in order to stockpile some tokens. Daisy the cow bumps into an electric wire and henceforth avoids that place. It could be said that both Daisy and I have been exhibiting learning behavior. But again, I think you will agree, the differences are greater than similarity. Next slide, please. The example that I've given illustrates something important and unique about human learning. Human learning is not something that merely happens. It has to be done and organized. And this is connected with the fact that humans practice skills. They practice memorization, while animals do not. What's more, animals do not teach their young, not outside of Disneyland, anyway. Human learning is a collective exercise and is mediated by institutions and involves not merely being shaped by experience, passively, but actively acquiring and seeking out factual knowledge. What is more, learning for humans is part of a narrative of a life that is led by the life that is made to live. Next slide. Well, perhaps I'll do people. I think I'll, I'll miss out communication. Move on. Thank you. Thank you. And again. And again. I want to see the bigger picture behind the things I've been mentioning, the human world to which they belong, <coughs> the world by which they are supported and which they support. This world is woven out of shared attention, out of a trillion cognitive handshakes. This world has been described as a semiosphere, a realm of signs and meanings, quite remote from the biosphere in which all other sentient beings live and have their being. Most of our actions in daily life, however concrete, typically make sense only with respect to frameworks of which we are conscious, which incorporate many layers of reflection. Think, really think, of all the steps you took to make the mistake of getting this talk this evening, beginning with a moment perhaps a few weeks ago when you saw today's program. Or think even of the elements that make up something as utterly commonplace and utterly tedious as shopping. It would require the whole of the remainder of my talk to unpack the innumerable implicit frames of reference that makes sense of the seemingly simple act of buying a can of beans. And none of these frames of reference has any counterpart in the light of beasts. This world, with its framework of understanding, transcends the organism Homo sapiens, as it was delivered by Darwinian processes hundreds of thousands of years ago. And those hundreds of thousands of years are the measure of how far Darwinitis, which sees us as simply other primates, is out of date. And the attempt to stuff this inescapably shared, temporary deep realm back into the intracranial darkness inside our skulls is inevitably inescapably doomed. And we inevitably close up all of the distance, distances that separate us from our organic state. So then we shall start explaining shopping or our aesthetic preferences by reference to the behavior of chimpanzees or herring In short, 
we shall reduce the humanities, the animatis. That's right. We have slept, we've stepped outside of our organic bodies into a realm where things are made explicit. And in that domain, uniquely, we guide, justify, and excuse our behavior according to general and abstract principles, create cities, laws, and institutions, and indeed entertain theories about our own nature and about the world. We frame, we frame our individual lives within a shared history, and we systematically inquire into the order of things and into the pattern of causation, into the physical laws that seem to underpin that order. Next slide, please. These phenomena, complex and pervasive though they are, are mere surface manifestations or symptoms of something even more profound, more complex and pervasive. Namely, that we are explicit animals who lead our lives, living out shared and individual narratives, rather than merely living them, who are conscious of ourselves and of others and the material world and of its intrinsic existence of properties in the way that no animal can match. Next slide. B.S. Ramachandran, like Colin Blakemore, a distinguished neuroscientist and wreath lecturer, surely spoke truly when he asserted that humanity transcends apehood to the same degree by which life transcends mundane physics and chemistry. Now, this seems so obvious that it's difficult to see why so many thinkers so stubbornly insist on overlooking what is in front of their noses. Slightly. The answer is in part because we're so used to using language carelessly, describing humans and animal animalomorphically and animals anthropomorphically, we no longer notice ourselves doing it. This is a theme for a talk itself. It would focus on seemingly innocent terms such as courtship and grooming. There's also a misplaced sense of honesty in which we feel forced to conclude that because we're like animals in some respects, birth, population and death and many things in between, our biological processes, we must be like animals in all respects. But this overlooks how we transform every aspect of the biological givens that frame our lives. As a doctor whose career spanned obstetrics and old age medicine, I can understand how this error might arise. We imagine what is more that after the origin of species, we're obliged to think of ourselves as animals. But to do so is to confuse our biological origins with our cultural needs. The organisms delivered by biological processes, which are ultimately an expression of the laws of physics, with people who are mutually and self-shaping by processes that are remote from those seen in the biological material of our bodies. But it is our linguistic, linguistic habits that are most potent. And this is true of neuromania. We personify the brain. We say how it decides, how it judges, how it communicates. So we're able then to brainify the person. Next slide. Now some dominatics are unable to ignore what's in front of their noses and acknowledge that there is a huge ditch between man and even the biologically closest beast. They've been strongly attracted to the notion of the meme first floated by Richard Dawkins in his first book, The Selfish Gene. A meme many of you will know. It's supposed to be... God, you're all so comfortable, weren't you? You were just thinking about, you know, God, I can imagine you were just drifting away. It isn't time to wake up yet, so you can carry on, don't worry. Hang on to this, I, I don't let it go now. Some Darwinitics, turn to where, just before the shock happened, are unable to ignore what is in front of their noses and acknowledge that there is a huge ditch between man and even the biological closest beasts. And they've been strongly attached, uh, attracted to the notion of the meme, first floated by Richard Dawkins in his first book, The Selfish Gene. The meme, you may know, is a unit of cultural transmission analogous to the gene unit of biological transmission. Like genes, memes are replicators, but they use minds as vehicles. According to many memophiles, they're like viruses that invade our mind brains. The memes that survive are those which, while they may not be good for the organism carrying, carrying them, are good for the survival of the groups of organisms who will carry the memes. And so we have a quasi darwinian notion of natural selection resulting in the differential survival of physicists applied to cultural change. If you find this notion, notion the slightest bit plausible, you find it less so when you look at the kinds of things that evolutionary psychologists give as examples of means. Next slide, please. Here are some suggested by Daniel Dennett, a philosopher who is very passionate about means, and they at once reveal why the idea is utterly vacuous. First, tolerance for free speech. While it may be good for the group, it's hardly an item with its own boundaries, in the way that a gene is. Abstract nouns do not correspond to items with their own edges. 
Secondly, it would seem the difference between the genotype and the phenotype is lost. Thirdly, ideas such as free speech are ones that we have to understand in order to embrace. And we may not assent to them, or do, us, do so on some occasions, not on others. Try assenting to or dissenting from your genes. And finally, it makes the mind a kind of lumber room, full of bric-a-brac. In short, meme theory is a measure of the desperation that is felt by some thinkers who want to quasi-biologize cultures, and hence the people that main, make, maintain, and modify our cultures. They imagine that seeing ourselves in, a fox, in the foxed mirror of the animal kingdom, we shall see ourselves more clearly. Though I'm not so persuaded that we've taken anything from our observation of animals other than what we put in, and that what seems to be new is simply bouncing our old ideas in an animal mirror. Next slide, please. It's time you'll be glad to learn for me to come to a close. I spent my hour addressing what seems to be one of the most widely received ideas of our time, namely that biology is the key to human nature, that we are best understood as largely unconscious or programmed organisms operating in a natural world rather than as conscious agents acting in a uniquely human one. And it follows from this that the traditional humanities are biological sciences in a primitive state of development. Next slide, please. But the consequences of biologism, if thought through, are appalling. The gap between human and non-human animal is elided. Even higher level awareness is reduced to the properties of living matter, concerned only with continuation through reproduction and repair. With the identification of the human mind with the functioning of the organic brain, the assumption of a fundamental difference between human actions and other events in the material world, between deliberately chosen, reason-led behavior, and materially caused material effects, seems shaky. The impersonal, unbreakable laws of the physical world, the blind watchmakers, the Darwin identify correct Darwin, sorry, Dawkins identify correctly as the drivers to the evolutionary process, encroach upon, engulf, and digest humanity. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Biologism, as I said at the beginning, is propped up by these two pillars of unwisdom, neuromania and Darwinitis. Next slide, please. And I hope you are sufficiently persuaded by my argument to agree that the most appropriate place for these ideas is as shown on the slide. You may think that no one takes them serious enough to follow them to their conclusions. If this were so, then they would still be important as obstacles to our trying to understand our nature in a way that doesn't invoke supernatural explanation. Next slide, please. For me, an atheist but also a humanist, naturalistic or biolog biologistic accounts of humanity are as unsatisfactory and as imprisoning as supernatural ones. A great task lies ahead in trying to make sense of ourselves, and neuromania and dominitis get in the way. Thank you. I'm one with Jerry Fodor when he says, we can't, as things stand now, so much as imagine the solution to the problem of consciousness. The revisions of our concepts and theories that imagining a solution will eventually require are likely to be very deep and very unsettling. There's hardly anything we might not have to cut loose from before the problem is through with us. And what's more, neuromania and Darwinitis may be w worse than obstructive, worse than stopping us even starting to think. They may be possibly dangerous. Next slide, please. For example, John Gray, once a political philosopher, once a thinker, but now a hugely acclaimed celebrity misanthropist and a ferocious anti-humanist, has argued in his best-selling Straw Dogs that Darwin has demonstrated, next slide, please, we're not particularly special. Human life has no more meaning than that of a slime mold. Man is only one of many species and not obviously worth preserving. Speak for yourself, I might say. Next slide, please. So ideas have consequences. Abstract arguments may begin look by looking like harmless puppies, but they may grow up to be something quite else. But I've written, why I've ridden this hobby horse for so long? Next slide, please. Well, it's time, you will be glad to learn, for me to start to wind up. As the late, great Humphrey Littleton might have put it, I hear the tortoise of time exploding in the microwave of eternity. Next slide, please. I spent my time criticizing what seems to be one of the most widely received ideas of the present day, namely that biology is the key to human nature. Those who try to explain love, conscience, human institutions by describing what they find when they appear into the brain are like someone who applies a stethoscope to an acorn. Next slide, please and hopes to hear the rustling of the breezes in the oak forest. Next slide, please. Neuromaniacs and Darwinitics are trying to find the community of minds forged from a trillion cognitive handshakes in bits of the standalone brain lighting up in the intracranial darkness. Even if you start from the brain, 
you have to leave the brain behind when you're talking about social phenomena that are established in and supported by the community of minds. Next slide, please. But I want to by emphasizing I have no problem with biology. For heaven's sake, I'm a doctor whose treatments have depended on biological science. I spent 30 or more years adding my minute grains of truth to the great monument that is clinical neuroscience. Nor, by the way, you'll be glad to know, do I have a religious agenda. I'm an atheist humanist, nor am I crazy enough to question Darwin's theory of evolution. I'm not a creationist nutter. And finally, don't call me that, I'm not a dualist who thinks of the mind as being like a ghost in the meat machine. But this can be a cue, I hope, for my final thought, which may be on the final slide. From philosopher Gilbert Ryle and his classic the concept of mind. Man, he said, need not be degraded to a machine by being denied to be a ghost in a machine. He might, after all, be a sort of animal, namely a higher mammal. There has yet to be ventured the hazardous leap to the hypothesis that perhaps he is man. And I think it's time we took that hazardous leap. Thank you.